One, two, ready, five. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Take your mask off. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bob. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the Church of the Good Shepherd, and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, future mothers, and all the people that have mothers. We're still practicing our COVID rules, so masks in the sanctuary, as well as the fellowship hall. And we have our designated areas. It's great to see so many people here. Do we have any guests today? On the, my right, your left, any guests today? Or second time visitor? And you are? Uh, and Paul. Oh, nice to meet you. Welcome, welcome. How about in the center? Any guests in the center or second time visitors or third time visitors? You have come down from up north for the weekend every year. Over here on this side, any guests on this side? To any guests in the fellowship hall, welcome. We have a birthday coming up this week, just one. Patsy Cazenza on the 13th will be having a birthday. <coughs> Operation Hope. Hey, Janice, I just yes. found out about an anniversary that's today. Yeah. David and Ann Bell, 51 years. Congratulations. <laughs> There's another birthday this week, too. He's not a member of our church. It's my son. Oh, His birthday's on the 12th. <laughs> so in celebration of Mother's Day, Operation Hope will be handing out the blessings next Saturday, the 15th. Today is the last day to donate, so if you haven't and you want to, I'm sure we'll be able to get it to them if you let us know. They're just looking for anything that a mom would not buy for herself because she's feeding her children. We ask you to remember that we collect non-perishable food for the sharing center in the narthex. Contributions have been down in that area because of the COVID. We're still looking for some people to fill some cleaning positions here in the church. If you'd like to volunteer to do that, Lee Parker would be more than happy to hear from you. And we have a blood drive on Sunday, June the 6th, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. If you would like to make an appointment, that will be made available. If you're able to give blood, please do so. I believe Mike would like to do a moment. Morning. 
a point of personal privilege, and I didn't clear this with them so they can take me to task afterward, but I wanted to welcome some people back who have not stand up because they're not visitors, and that's Kevin and Charlotte Frederick and their family. They are uh, members here for quite some time, and they are back in the area, and uh, we're happy to have them back. They're back to the family. You can discuss that with me later if that was inappropriate. <laughs> I'm never shy about that. So I um, wanted to talk a little bit about our special offerings. So uh, back in Easter, we took the first of our special offerings for the Presbyterian Church during the calendar year, and that was one great hour of sharing. And I don't have the exact numbers, but I want to let you know that maybe Ann's going to share that. <laughs> with the 500 match, I sent $1,265. That's excellent. And that's up quite a bit from last year. So, so now, in two weeks, on Pentecost, guess which offering we're going to have? Pentecost. The Pentecost <laughs> offering. So the Pentecost offering is really about young people in, in the church. Can we go to the next slide? We're having technical issues this morning. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. There it is. So this tells you a little bit about what the Pentecost offering is. Again, the focus is on young people and on mich ministries of education and their spiritual journeys. Go ahead. <clears throat> next. Yep. And you can see it encourages not only young youth, or young adults to help shape their faith. So, next slide. <clears throat> this is a per some of the percentages of where the offering goes. 25% to support young volunteer, adult volunteers, 25% to support ministries with youth, including the Triennium, and 10% is devoted to children at risk for education and safe havens. Next slide. This one is one where we get to keep some of the money here. Forty percent of it stays in our local congregation. In the past, we've used this to help supplement uh, mission, or our trip for our young people to Montreat. This year, we'll see how things go, whether Montreat's happening. Last year was virtual. Uh, if it's this year and we have some young people that go, the the committee uh, has recommended that that's probably where the money will go. Now, I could tell you about Montreat, except for I've never attended Montreat. I have been there a couple times, but I have a couple friends who I think can tell you a little bit about how this offering has helped supplement their experience. So I will start with the first one. <clears throat> I think. There we go. Do you want, Pat, you want to go ahead and come up and then maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe while uh, we're, we're trying that one, we'll let you go. If Evan pops up, I'll shut up. <laughs> and then you can complete. Good morning. I'm Pat Hollingsworth. Many of you know me as Randolph, but um, youth leadership for 14 years it was challenging and it was very rewarding. And one of the most rewarding things every year was going to Montreat. David, can you up the volume? He's quiet in the beginning. Uh, Montreat for me was a life-changing experience. I formed bonds with every member of our youth group. I formed bonds with some strangers from uh, across the country that I never met before. Uh, it was a very eye-opening experience, and it really helped grow my faith and made me feel closer to God than ever before. And I wanted to thank everyone for their past Pentecost donations, and to please prayfully donate this year as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Evan Hawk. And so as you see, um, he was probably the la one of my last youth, and Elaney in the nursery was one. Every year it was so rewarding to look forward to it, to plan, to prepare. We did a lot of fundraising. Many of you were here for the spud and salads, the car washes. And when we got there, we used to call it Jesus, what do we call it? <laughs> Jesus camp. And one year, uh, Austin Norris said, it is not a camp, it is a village. It is Jesus village. And it was the one place the youth could go and share their faith with a thousand sometimes other teenagers and know they were safe. They were safe in a community of loving Christians 
There were adults from all groups looking out for their children as well as others. I'll never forget cooking three pounds of bacon every morning for six days. That's, that's a good memory. So I really do encourage you to give back because we did have children that, although fundraising was done, we needed a little extra to help them get there. And, and uh, every dime, and I mean dimes, even pennies, are appreciated. So please prayerfully consider the Pentecost offering. Thank you, Pat and Evan. So, again, prayerfully consider this offering. It's in two weeks we'll receive the actual offering. You can, do, you can uh, give it any time between now and the end of this month. If you want to earn, learn a little bit more about the offering, there's a URL up there you can go to, and it'll tell you a lot more about the Pentecost offering and the work that's being done for the youth of the church through this. So I thank you very much. Let's stand and recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
are entering confession. We have been called to follow Christ by obeying his one commandment, that we love one another as he has loved us. Let us confess how we have fallen short of that love. Loving God, we have not loved you or each other with our whole hearts. Forgive us, we pray, and lead us toward wholeness, that we may be filled with joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Christ loves us so much that he laid down his life for us and calls us his friends. If we can forgive our friends, how much more does Christ forgive us? Get some exercise this morning. <laughs> Praise for the Bell's 51st anniversary. Somebody already said that, but I have that here. Uh, that's great. There's so many people with anniversaries, but that's a wonderful milestone. We have a lot of prayers today, so uh, just keep these people in your hearts and your prayers. Joanne Stewart is here, but she was in and out of the hospital this week. She snuck in and she snuck out. <laughs> Chip Curran uh, is in the hospital, and he has prostate cancer. You know that. George Wilcox is at Orlando Regional Medical Center, and he had a major stroke. I believe that is uh, Gwen. He was the pastor at Rock Ledge. Rock Ledge. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, John Curry is home, but he has cancer. Um, Gail Davis is recovering from eye surgery, and it wasn't just shots, it was surgery. Rick Fortin's mother uh, is here. Uh, they're not here today, but is come to live with her son. She has rapidly worsening Parkinson's. Kathy McAndrew, who some of you know, um, has cancer, was diagnosed with cancer, uh, and she is having tests and surgery, and that da those dates will be determined. It is breast cancer. Uh, Reverend Mary Sample, who we've been praying with, uh, had another back surgery, and uh, more to up here than down below. Um, Phyllis Koch is in Life Care Center of Melbourne. Jack Fawcett is right now in Indian River Rehab, but he's coming home to home care. Rich Randolph has recovered or is recovering from his second carpal tunnel surgery. Francis Payne is continuing recovery. Um, Nancy Shalou is recovering from her shoulder repair, and I saw her this week. And uh, she's, in, she's in good form. She just has to do a lot of exercising and PT. Uh, continue prayers for Diane Randolph, Cheryl Hoffman, Gloria Robinson, Kinsley, um, Jenny Monk's niece, who is four years old with cancer and uh, was in the hospital last week, so I have no update on that. Uh, for the shut-ins, Janet Bassett, Phyllis Eddy, Ivy Lawrence, Shirley Parrish, Artie Richards, Shirley Storm, Lee Wilson, Don Woodard, and Jack Fawcett. And for those recovering from COVID and who are grieving a loss from COVID. And those with cancer, Dana Labrizi, she joined uh, the early service this morning yeah. uh, from New York. Virtual. Virtual. Virtual, yeah. From New York? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ann Voss, and we mentioned Chip Curran and Kathy McAndrew, but they will be on this list. Natalie Jones, and uh, we mentioned Kinsley already. So those are just some of the few that really need our prayers. Yes. Good. Yes. And now for our prayer of intercession. 
We sing for joy, O God, for you are coming to judge the world with righteousness and fairness between nations and between people. We pray for the poor and the desperate, as well as for those who abuse and oppress them, both here and abroad. Comfort those who suffer and chasten those who cause their suffering, that your justice may be known in all the earth. We pray for families, communities, and nations torn apart by violence. Heal the broken places and imbue your earth with peace. We pray for the sick and the dying, for those who are friendless and lonely, for those living with grief or depression. Bring them your friendship and renew their joy. We pray for ourselves, your church, that we may bear fruit of the fruit of peace, hope, and love, fruit that will last. Now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our friend, and in the Holy Spirit poured out on us, we sing a new song to praise you, for you are doing marvelous things. Amen. Amen. And let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. sermon and today we're talking about noses have you ever thought about noses some are big and some are little some are flat and some are pointy everyone has one even you and it's right in the middle of your face there's a saying about noses it's as plain as the nose in your face isn't that a silly saying but sometimes we don't think about something even when it is as plain as the nose on our face in our story from the bible today Jesus is explaining his love to his friends. He says, Even as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. That's simple, isn't it? Who loved Jesus? Yes, God the Heavenly Father loved Jesus. And who does Jesus love? Yes, he loves us. Jesus said, Father loved me, I loved you. It isn't hard to understand that Jesus' Father loved him. It's harder sometimes to think that he loves us. But he does. He said that he loves us, and he showed his love by coming to earth and living on earth. God showed the people of earth how much God loved them, and they told others, and those people still told still others. Jesus wanted his friends to know that he loved them very much. Even when he was on the cross, Jesus showed his love for his people when he asked his father to forgive the ones who were hurting him. Asking God to forgive those people shows us just how much he loved everyone. But there was one more thing that Jesus wanted his friends to know. He said, I command these things to you, that you love one another. What does Jesus want us to do? He wants us to love one another. That's right. 
Remember, it's not hard. Jesus simply wants us to be kind to other people. That might mean not making fun of someone at school. It might be helping someone pick up things that fell out of their backpack. It might mean not pushing in front of someone else in line. It might mean setting the table without being asked or making sure you do the dishes. Robert and Megan and Samantha. Love one another. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. We can do that, can't we? Jesus loves us. Let's thank him right now. Dear Lord, thank you for our friends and family. Thank you for our doctors and nurses. Thank you for our teachers and pastors. Please watch over those that are sick and hurt and help them find relief in you. Please watch over us and help us stay healthy and make the best choices we can to return to church or our computer screens next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. I love you. Thank you. You can clap for that. That's all right. Yeah. Well, take an inventory, as I sometimes call it. It's good to see you. Happy Mother's Day. And now, let us stand and sing. No, no, stay seated, sorry.
uh, we should have in our prayer time included, um, this is a story, I don't know firsthand anything about it, I haven't, I haven't read it or seen it in the news, but somebody told me that there was a mom that had nine kids, nine. Remember, remember Octa Mom from a few years ago? At one time. At one time. I, I, that is amazing. But anyway, we should definitely keep them in prayer. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Our passage today comes from the Gospel of John, John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. This is immediately following our passage from last week. Hear the word of the Lord. This is Jesus speaking, or continuing to speak. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you, I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we do continue this week from last week's uh, passage as Jesus continues to educate his followers on the very nature of things, using the vivid imagery of the vine and the branches. Last week, we focused on Jesus' assurance when he says, as I abide in you, communicating to us that no matter the darkness, we are not alone. No matter the difficulty, we can take solace that Jesus abides in us. And with this assurance, we can now better hear the invitation Jesus makes when he says and calls us to abide in my love. Abide in my love, Jesus says. Jesus invites us to allow his abiding presence in us to actually make a difference in our lives. That is why we started where we did last week, with Jesus' abiding presence in us and the assurance of that fact, because Jesus' presence is the source of our ability to live life differently. We continue on from last week's reading as Jesus keeps teaching us about love and joy and fruit-bearing with his vine and his branches metaphor. This week, we will explore even more this vine and branches, as it can certainly bears implication regarding our very identity and ability as Christ's followers. You see, the image Jesus conveys is that we are a part, a connected part of God. Not only is Jesus present with us, but we are part of God's system, the way God is working in the world, what God is continuing to do in the world, what God has created us to do in the world. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches with the intent that we will produce fruit, which presumably has impact on others who then also are then grafted into the vine that is Jesus. Jesus kind of lays out the flow of things in verse 9. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. So we see the Father's love given to Jesus, Jesus' love given to us, 
And then Jesus tells us to abide in that love, abide in it, because it is indeed life-changing. Jesus is speaking to us of a sense of flow, a, a picture of connection and dependence, of core relationship and nourishment that all begins with and is sourced by God. So it is all connected. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Instantly connecting us with the Father's love. Which is no small thing because that love of the Father is eternal. 1 Corinthians 13, and some of you will know the uh, title that 1 Corinthians is normally referred to. It is the what chapter? The love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, 13.8 says this, love never ends. It never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Love never ends. And friends, if love never ends and God is eternal, well, that puts us in a pretty good place when we hear Jesus say, as the Father has loved me, so I love you, and abide in that love. Here we are tracing through Jesus' teaching, the, the backdrop of his new commandment for us to love one another, which he first declares in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. To love one another is Jesus' final and empowered teaching to further guide us to live life the way it is intended, the way it is designed. And we all benefit from that. So Jesus sets the stage in verse 10. Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So I just want to voice and note the, the, the use of the word commandments here. When Jesus says, first, you keep my commandments, and then second, just as I have kept my Father's commandments. And I can't help but think both of Jesus' new commandment, that of love one another, which is the, the theme of, that Jesus is talking about here, but I also kind of am forced to think about the original Ten Commandments in the Old Testament uh, here as well, with the two uses of the word commandments. And often when I and perhaps we hear the word commandment, our mind kind of reflexively wants to jump to rule following, right, when we hear that. Here as we are on Mother's Day, you know, often mothers have some rules of the house, right, that they lay down for the kids. Rules, you can call them commandments. <laughs> and you better follow that, right? <laughs> so in the use of the word commandment, we kind of we understand, we know what that is. But in our society, which is a litigious society, uh, this often means how close can I come to the line without going over it, Right? Every child is, is pre-law, right? Because they want to see just how close they can come to the line without going over it. So I've constructed a, a new analogy that attempts to illuminate keeping commandments or the misuse of keeping commandments with abiding in love, which is our charge today. Jesus' new commandment, which attempts to stop our misuse of the original set of Ten Commandments. It involves the target sport of bowling. I spent way too long wondering if I should call bowling a sport, but the target sport of bowling <laughs> is where I ended up. On any given throw, the objective is to knock down pins residing at the end of the lane. But along the path, there are those nasty gutters on either side of the bowling lane. 
Those gutters can swallow up your ball and take you out of play. Your bowling ball won't ever hit any of the pins at the end of the lane if it ends up in the gutter. Now, I'm sure someone's going to tell me a story at the close of this worship service how their ball actually jumped out of the gutter and got a strike. All analogies fall down somewhere. Anyway, regarding those gutters, there is an addition that some bowling lanes use to help bowlers with those pesky gutters that are on either side of the lane. Have you ever seen those bumpers that get put up? Have you ever used those bumpers that are put up? Those bumpers effectively deflect poorly rolled balls so that the bowling ball doesn't fall out of play, so that it stays in the lane with a much improved opportunity for your ball to actually hit its mark. I think Old Testament commandments are in one way kind of like those bumpers. Old Testament commandments are, are kind of the low watermark of living love, which makes them akin to the new commandment that Jesus is talking about with his disciples. They're kinfolk. Now, you remember the Ten Commandments, which include don't murder, don't covet, don't give false witness. These life guidelines serve to essentially keep us in bounds with the future hope that we will actually keep on rolling down the lane of life to achieve our goal. Old Testament commandments are, are kind of like that. They keep us in the lane. But they, uh, like the bumpers, are not the main point of the game of life. They just help guide us to where we should be heading. But this new commandment, which Jesus is talking about, is, well, more core. It's more central than that. Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This new commandment is not found on the borders, on the edges of life's path. It actually defines the center of our way forward. In my bowling analogy, it is the center of the lane leading to uh, the way that the pins are. The center. Now, I have to note that it, a bowler will tell me, no, it's a curved path through the lane because you throw the ball with spin so that it leans in between the first and the third pin, and then a, there's a cascading effect, and they all fall down. That's a strike. So I have to note that because Jim Barrett's part of our congregation, and he's a bowling instructor. <laughs> but for an easier time with my analogy, let's just call the desired path the center of the lane. This new commandment which Jesus shares is the center of the lane of the Christian life. As compared with the Old Testament Ten Commandments, which can be seen uh, more like useful bumpers, just trying to keep us in play. Love is the path that we are empowered to follow the path that will yield the desired results both as the ball is traveling and when it gets to the end of the lane. The center is living love. And so Jesus gives us a new commandment to make the point abundantly clear. If we live love, we will hit the mark with our lives. Now hear this, living love, traveling down the center of the lane, actually keeps us clear of those gutters on the sides of the bowling lane. If you're in the center, you're not in jeopardy of hitting the bumpers, well, or going in the gutter. If you are in the center, you are not near the gutter, so bumpers become, well, ancillary. I don't care if the bumpers are in there or not. I'm going right down the center. 
That is why Paul, when talking about the fruit of the Spirit, goes as far as to say there is no law against such things. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. There is no law against living love or the outcropping of living love like joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity. Paul in Galatians 5 is actively talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and John won't get on to talking about the Spirit until the end of the 15th chapter, where he calls the Spirit the advocate. But rest assured, the Spirit and Jesus and God are all on the same team, working the same purpose, trying to enlighten and empower our journey as followers and believers. There is no law against living love. If you are living love, there is no bumper needed to keep you heading the way you should be heading because you are already heading the way you should be heading. Y'all can play that back during the week. (laughs) Jesus here is teaching us the very center Jesus is pointing us in the direction to live life as it has been designed by God. Why is love the center of it all? Well, because God is love. Or love is of God, it says in the King James Version, 1 John 4, 8, and then again in 16. And this whole vine and branches imagery works perfectly with the notion that love is of God and that we are all connected to God through the vine, which is Jesus. What's flowing there is love from God to Jesus to us, to others. The source moving through the vine imagery is love. Love being eternal because it is sourced in the Father. Love being offered and provided through Jesus, the vine. Love being the the new commandment, which no longer just keeps us off the ledges of failure, but inspires us to stay in the center of who we are created to be. So if it is true that the very core of the universe, God, is love, and God wants us to grow in love, then what Jesus is describing is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, connecting us to the oldest and the most foundational underpinning of all that is. In the Bible, God does not command us to grow in intelligence. If the very core of the universe was intelligence, then God would have said, well, get smarter and smarter. But God's not pressing towards that. If the very essence of the universe was power, then God would want us to grow in power. God's not pressing us towards that. But because the core of the universe is love, because God is love, then God wants us to grow in love. God wants us to experience love, to grow in love, and to live love. So the new commandment is to love one another. And now we know why, because love is not just a good thing to do. It actually finds its source in something that is eternal, God's self. God lives it with Jesus. Jesus Jesus lives it with us, and we are to live it with each other. It is just that simple and foundational. Love is the center of the lane. Oh, and by the way, living love is not just for the payoff at the end of the run. Living love is pays dividends day in and day out. Jesus says in our passage, verse 11, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The payoff of living love is joy. 
Joy, when we all get to heaven, to be sure, but joy right now as well, along the journey. Living love brings joy in life. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that living love is always easy or even simple. Just that it is immensely worth it. Living love is who we are created to be and do. So it makes sense that it brings both purpose and joy into our lives because that's what we are created to do. God commanding us to love one another is like God commanding a fish to swim. It's like God commanding a bird to fly. It's like God commanding an orchid to be beautiful. When God commands us to love as God loves, God is simply commanding us to be the kind of people that we were created to be in the first place. And living into what we were made to be, well, that brings joy. Today, as you know, is Mother's Day. I think we often see some of the best images of God's love through a mother's love for her child. God commanding us to love one another is like God commanding a mother to love her child. My mom didn't need to be commanded to love me. She just did. That love was in her, just waiting to come out. Laura didn't need to be commanded to love Kaylee, Kyle, or Hayden. She just did. It was already there, waiting to come out. And as it came out, it brought joy. Loving a child brings joy, a level of joy that perhaps was not previously known or realized. Friends, there are payoffs when we live into our identity. There are payoffs when we let what is already inside out. God's love, friends, is inside of you. Let it out. Let it out. Letting what is already inside out. Now, I must confess the line, letting what is already inside out on Mother's Day can be interpreted as something entirely different. For that is the typical way a mom becomes a mom, letting what is already inside out out. You know, the nine-month journey to birth is fairly scripted, and we all certainly know that what is inside does indeed need to come out. In fact, as time goes on and on, internal motivations usually build and build for said expectant mother to increasingly want to let what is already inside out. It is a biological fact that what is already inside needs to come out. So also with God's love, which is growing inside of us. It needs to come out. God's love through Jesus may not have a scripted nine-month timeline, but one thing is for sure, it is supposed to come out. Love is supposed to be lived out. Passed on, released, birthed. It is sourced in God. It is conveyed through Jesus. It is sustained through the Holy Spirit. It is delivered to us, and we are to birth it into the world. Letting it out is how we progress down the center of the lane. It is how we proactively keep from bouncing off the bumpers or worse, falling into the gutters. Living into love is what Jesus' new commandment is all about. It simultaneously keeps us on track as well as helping us enjoy the journey that is before us. Living love brings joy. Friends, Jesus guides and empowers our Christian life so aptly in this command. Love one another. 
It is the way things are. It is sourced in God. It is what we were made to be and do. So I invite you to let it out. It is in there. When Jesus says, as I abide in you, it is in there. Let it out. And if it has been nine months since you have let it out, you may need to get down to the hospital (laughs) because something is seriously wrong. Yes, go down to the hospital, but don't check in as a parent. Instead, volunteer to be a greeter, a gift shop worker, a spiritual caregiver. Our own Mike Buford can help train you to do that. Let it out. Friends, find a way to live love this week, and don't be surprised when you enjoy the journey. Amen. Amen. Friends, ring the bell of God's love this week. Ring it loud so others can hear. Go in God's grace and know that God is with you as you go. Amen. Amen.